not terrifying in a sense, but this I think is the 92nd sermon we've had on the Gospel of Mark. So thank you for your patience. <laughs> That's, that's quite. A, I'm not sure I've ever preached a series of sermons that's got 92 sermons in it, so thank you for lasting. So chapter 16, verse 14 to the end. <clears throat> Afterward he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat, and he upbraided them with their unbelief and the hardness of heart, because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. And they shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So then, after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat at the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them, and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. I thought uh, just before we begin this afternoon, I might, I might read a few words to you from the expository thoughts of J.C. Ryle on this, on this portion of the word. Now, I was meditating on these words myself, and I thought well, this would be, I, I think, very edifying encouraging for the little congregation. This is what Ryle says about the continuation of miracles. The age of miracles, no doubt, is long past. They were never meant to continue beyond the first establishment of the church. It is only when plants are first planted that they need daily watering and support. And the whole analogy of God's dealings with his church forbids us to expect that miracles would always continue. In fact, miracles would cease to be miracles if they happened regularly without cessation or intermission. It is well to remember this. The remembrance may save us from much perplexity. But though the age of physical miracles is past, we may take comfort in the thought that the Church of Christ shall never want Christ's special aid in its seasons of special need. The great head in heaven will never forsake his believing members. His eye is continually upon them. He will always time his help wisely and come to their succour in the day that he is wanted. When the enemy shall come up like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. And finally, let us never forget the Christ-believing church in the world is of itself a standing miracle. The conversion, the perseverance in grace of every member of that church is a sign and a wonder as great as the raising of Lazarus from the dead. The renewal of every saint is as great a marvel as the casting out of a devil or the healing of a sick man or the speaking with a new tongue. Let us thank God for this and take courage. The age of spiritual miracles is not yet past. Happy are they who have learned this by experience, and can say, I was dead and am alive again. I was blind, but now I see. Thank you, J.C. Ryle. And isn't it marvellous how those who have gone on before are still with us with their counsel through the books they've written? 
Well, brethren, as we turn our attention to these last couple of verses, I'd just like to read them again to you. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven. And he sat at the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. The Gospel of Mark uh, began with these remarkable words. The beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And then having dealt very br briefly with John the Baptist, we read that Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, Repent ye and believe the gospel. And the gospel having begun that way, it concludes with Jesus Christ continuing through the ministry of the apostles uh, to work with them as they preach the gospel. So that's marvellous. The gospel of Mark is bookended uh, by the gospel of Jesus Christ in, in perfect clarity. I think that's marvellous. And as, as the Lord Jesus Christ has commissioned his church in what we call the Great Commission, immediately preceding these verses, he has assured them uh, that as they go forth, he goes with them. Matthew's Gospel and the account of the Great Commission that is given there greatly emphasizes that. There the Lord Jesus is quoted as saying, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Now bear in mind that that's a promise given to the church that he has just commissioned to go into all the world and preach the Gospel. I'm going to be with you always. How long? Well, even right to the end of the world. And so Mark, as he takes up this gospel work that's given into the hands of the church, uh, he describes it as they go forth preaching everywhere and the Lord is working with them. And so I'd like us to just to spend a few moments this afternoon uh, looking at what we've got here in this portion just briefly. We, we can see here the presence and working of Jesus Christ with his church. He's present and he's working with us. And I'd like to just highlight three things. That this is the presence and the working of the exalted Lord. You see in verse 19, that when the Lord's spoken to them, he's received up into heaven. And he sits at the right hand of God. But it's also the presence of that exalted Lord with us, and it's his working as the Lord works with them and, can, and accompanies them wherever they go. So those three points, the exalted Lord present with us and working with us. So first of all, uh, there's the ex exaltation of this Lord who's with us. Mark, in his characteristically brief and to the point way, uh, simply describes the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ in these brief words. He says, after the Lord has spoken to them, he's received up into heaven and he sat at the right hand of, the, of God. It's very brief, it's very much to the point. But uh, one of the things we must not miss as we, as we think about that is that immediately before the Great Commission is given. So it's all in one package here. Immediately before the Great Commission is given, the Lord Jesus has upbraided his disciples for not believing the report of his resurrection. So what we've got here is the, the, the resurrected, ascended, that is, gone to heaven, and sitting at the right hand of God, Lord. <laughs> and uh, that, that's, a, that's a very wonderful thing for us to think about as Christians. Uh, the Christian church, and we as part of it, 
are engaged with and involved with a living saviour. And uh, it's one of the things that, that can easily slip like sand through our fingers and we'd be left empty-handed. Uh, it's one of the things I think that troubles many Christians and reformed Christians is that we, we get so involved with the theology and the doctrine of things, which we need to be clear on, that we get left, as it were, with the impression that what we're dealing with in our Christian faith is just a whole series of propositional truths, like in a, in a book. Whereas, in fact, what, what, what the, the Christian faith and the whole truth and doctrine is designed to do is bring us with our minds and through the truth into the presence, and you could almost say, and we say it carefully, into the presence so that we can encounter a living saviour through that truth. And, and, and when it comes to a passage like, like we've got here in Mark's Gospel, it's not designed to be sort of taken on and we sort of rest on our hand and we say, yep, Jesus is, is risen. Yeah, I know that. We all believe in the resurrection of the dead. And Jesus has ascended. Yeah, of course he has. I know that. And, and he's sitting at the right hand of God the Father. Yeah, yeah we all know that's a doctrinal truth. But that's not how it's designed to be taken by us. What, what, what this is designed to be for us is a personal engagement with a living Saviour. Jesus Christ is not dead. He's alive. He rose again bodily from the grave. He's not dead. The Son of God who took to himself our human nature has raised that human nature and he's carried it now into heaven with him. He's not dead. He's alive. And even though we can't see him with our eyes, he's as real as if he was right here in the building with us or sitting next to you and you could touch him. He's gone physically and bodily to heaven, tells, Mark tells us. And there in heaven, that living Saviour has been given all authority and is seated at the right hand of God. You can't see him with your eyes physically, but you can see him with the eye of faith. And uh, there at the right hand of God, he's got all authority given to him. And now that's, that's what I want us to focus our attention on and get a sense of and, and have in a sense grip our hearts as, as we think about the exalted Lord. He's my saviour. And you confess he's your saviour. Let, let, let's see something of his glory and, and let it encourage us because it is all our encouragement. Without this, uh, we, we would have almost nothing at all uh, to encourage us. So Mark tells us about the ascension of Jesus. And he tells us that he's received up <laughs> into, into glory. After the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into glory. Now that reminds me of Psalm 47, verse 5. Listen to this. God is with shouts gone up. The Lord with trumpets sounding high. Sing praise to God. Sing praise. Sing praise. Praise to our God. Sing ye. That's, that's what is really being communicated to us. This, this is our risen, ascended Lord, and he is gone, and he's been received up into glory as a victorious king. That's the idea of it. A victorious king has been received upon his victory into his rightful place in the kingdom of heaven, and he's on the throne, 
and, and the whole of creation <laughs> is, is called to bow before him and worship and sing his praises. And certainly, certainly, the church that knows him and loves him and has been loved by him and saved by him should live, as it were, with its eyes lifted towards heaven saying, I know my Saviour is risen. I know he's ascended and he is at the right hand of God. Why? For me and for us. This is a victorious uh, ascension into his rightful place as the mediatorial king. And now when the Lord Jesus Christ is received up, Mark tells us, he's not done with yet. He's, he's seated at the right hand of God. Now, theologically and in our doctrine, we call this both the ascension and the session of the Lord Jesus Christ at the right hand of the Father. And the idea of that, of that terminology of the session is that it be, there's a session or, or, or a time yeah. where he's seated on the throne as the mediatorial king that begins with his entry into heaven upon his ascension and continues right through the history of the world in this gospel age until he's returned and judged the world in righteousness. And then he will deliver up the kingdom to the Father who, and to God who will be all in all. Now in this inter intervening period of time before, between his ascension into glory and his return again, he is seated at the right hand of the Father and, uh, and, and it's as he's seated at the right hand of the Father that he is described here as working with them. <laughs> he's working with his church. He's immediately and personally involved with the life and the work of the Christian church. And one would think that as we are one little twig on the great plant of, of, of Jesus planting in the world, that is with us too, you know, because we were one little part of that true visible church in the world. And so we link in here to the Lord Jesus Christ's great mediatorial rule uh, on behalf of his church. Now, as the Lord Jesus Christ ascended into glory, and takes his place at the right hand of God. I'd, I'd like to just encourage you in this, that that is the beginning of his mediatorial rule over the nations in its formal sense. He takes, he takes the throne at, at the Father's right hand, and it's like as if a dialogue takes place between them. This dialogue is sort of recorded for us in Psalm 2. Uh, the father turns, as it were, towards the son and he says to him, verse two, Psalm 2, verse 6, I have set my holy king upon my holy hill of Zion and I will declare the decree. And the son turns to the father and replies, The Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, now listen, ask of me, and I shall give thee, what? I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. There he is at the right hand of the Father and he's just said to his church, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. And he's saying now to the Father, Father, you have said to me, ask and I'll give you the heathen for your inheritance, the uttermost parts of the earth for your possession. Now, Father, I ask of you, I ask of you. And the Father gives him the possession. 
and having received the possession of the inheritance of, of the elect of God scattered throughout every nation and tribe and, and tongue in every little village and thatched hut or, or, or in some splendid mansion uh, on, on Hollywood Boulevard, wherever the elect are found, uh, God the Father has given to Jesus Christ authority, <laughs> authority to gather them. And as I said, that session at the Father's right hand with authority over all things for the sake of his church extends from the time of his ascension until the final judgment day. And there will be a redeemed church that's gathered and perfected. Nothing can stay the hand of Almighty God as it's working through Jesus Christ in the salvation of his church. Now when you think of that, uh, that's exactly what Matthew, in his gospel account, focuses our attention in upon. He focuses on the authority that God has given to the Father, uh, to, to Jesus Christ, as his reward. Uh, just turn your Bible with me to, to Mark's gospel for a moment. This is so good to be sort of reminded of, and it's even great to be able to see in your Bible where it sits on the page, so that as you think about it, your memory is in a sense triggered. So Matthew 28 and uh, verse 18 is what we want. But Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Now the word power there is somewhat a little bit misleading in our English. Uh, the, the word that's used there is not power in the sense of dunamis, the Greek word that we get dynamite from. But the word that's used there is another word that means authority. And that, that carries with it the whole idea of right to rule, right to exercise dominion, and then tucked into its pocket, as it were, is all the power to be able to actually rule in the way that God has designed. Now, if we were to think about this, the idea here is that Jesus Christ is put in the position where he, as it were, rides the horse of providence. If providence is God's everywhere present power to unfold and execute his decrees, well, God has given the reins of providence into the hands of this resurrected, ascended, and exalted king. And, and, and as Jesus Christ holds those reins in his hands, he's got the right and the authority to bring to pass all those things that are necessary for his his. His church, in all its circumstances and trials and troubles and ups and downs and encouragements and disappointments, to gain the victory at every point. And uh, he's got the reins of providence in his hands so that the church not only has an abstraction, but the church has people, individuals, men and women and boys and girls, have a living saviour with all authority over all things focused in upon them and their life and their circumstances and their challenges and their trials so that he is able to work all things together for their good. And that's an incredibly, incredibly marvellous reality. And, and, and sometimes I think, brethren, we, we fall into the trap of, of imagining that God's decrees and God's providence are some sort of cold me me mechanism uh, that's taking place in and around us. You know, the wheels of providence turn and grind exceeding fine. And it's like a machine, but, but it's not. This, this is the living God through the living Saviour who is our Redeemer and the king and head of the church is ruling over all things. And he's the one 
Here we bring it all together. He's the one who says to his church, now, with everything in place, with me as all your hope and encouragement, go preach the gospel to every creature and I will be with you to the end of the world. In fact, in Matthew's gospel, uh, he joins the assertion of his authority together with the, with the command by means of that word, therefore. Did you notice it in verse 19? Go ye therefore, because I have this authority given to me in heaven and earth, all authority, this will become the great encouragement and indeed the basis for the church to go. Don't be fearful. Don't, don't, don't be anxious. Don't, don't be hesitant. Don't, don't worry. Don't wonder what might happen. Uh, all things are in the hands of Almighty God through Jesus Christ, our Saviour. That, that's where the gospel touches upon us in the Great Commission. So that's a marvellous, marvellous thing. This is the exalted Lord. And, uh, and, and he is the one who says to us, uh, I am with you. I am with you. And uh, I'm going to be working uh, with you and through you in this great work of the preaching of the gospel. A few, quite a few things I'd love to say to you more about that authority of Jesus Christ in the preaching of the gospel, but we'll leave it for another day. The, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ then, as the risen Lord, uh, is, is uh, with, the, with the preaching church as it carries the gospel forth with what we could call his abiding presence. He is present with us. Now, before the Lord Jesus Christ ascended into glory, before he sat at the right hand of the Father and took hold of the promise and uh, began in this new and wonderful way to exercise his mediatorial dominion over the nations, before he did all that, he did some wonderful things. And he did one most significant thing that guaranteed that he would be with his preaching church no matter where it went as it goes about the work. Now, how did, what did he do? Well, first of all, uh, like I pointed out to you in Matthew chapter 28 and uh, verse 20, he says to them as they go forth to preach, Lo, I am with you even to the end of the world. Now, we say to ourselves, yeah, I know that. I've heard that a thousand times, Pastor. Why are you, why are you saying that again to us? But think about this. This is spoken to the apostles, but those apostles... <laughs> Uh, who heard these words were not going to live to the end of the world. They, they were the first preachers that Jesus Christ sends forth in the Christian era. And those apostles are going to be the foundation for the Christian church. Their doctrine and their teaching will be gathered into the scriptures and it will become the rule for the church's life, its doctrine, its worship, and its government. But they're going to die. Their work will be gathered up into the scriptures, but they themselves are going to die. What will happen? How will, this, how will God be with them? Well, those apostles are going to teach other faithful men. And you see this happening in the scriptures. Paul teaches Timothy and Titus. And Timothy and Titus are commanded and called by Paul to teach other faithful men the form of sound words that is being given to them. And the Christian church 
the apostolic church is going to continue to pass on the apostolic doctrine in its integrity and in its strength and its power down through the generations of ministry. It's not like the Roman Catholic Church imagines. The apostolicity of the church is through the formal ordination from the so-called first Pope Peter uh, down through the bishops, and so you've got a connection through ordination to Peter. That's not the ap ap apostolicity of the church. The apostolicity of the church that Jesus is with is in the doctrine and the truth and the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ where that truth and the apostolic doctrine is and where it's taught and preached in the world and is carried out into every nation, tribe and tongue, there the Lord Jesus Christ is present. And that's what he's saying. And brother, and that's where churches like ours fit in. It's not, as, it's not like as if the, the God in some special way through Jesus Christ has singled out the EPC and is with us and nobody else. God forbid. Well, that'd be miserable. But it is rather that the EPC, this little church we're part of, and even this little congregation, has Jesus Christ present in it and with it through the apostolic doctrine and through the Holy Spirit as he accompanies that truth and that gospel and works in our hearts and gathers us to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's where his church is. That's where he is. Lo, I am with you. I am with you. And that's so important. It's not Lo is out there somewhere. Lo is with the church, wherever it is. Lo, I am with you, he says, to his true church in all ages until he returns again. And it's like having the Lord Jesus Christ from heaven look straight at us and, and he looks us in the eye and he says to us, now listen, don't be doubting this. As you have that historic apostolic Christian faith in your midst and as you have embraced it into your hearts and as you are representing it and as you are preaching it in this place, I am with you. And to me that's utterly marvellous. If that wasn't true, there's no way I'm coming back here next Sunday morning. It's because the Lord Jesus Christ is with us by his word, his gospel and his spirit that there is a church. He's what produces it. He's what maintains it. He is with it. That's, that's an incredible reality that by faith we need to embrace and focus upon. The church of Jesus Christ is not a human institution. It's not something produced by our fathers or grandfathers because they had a vision about what the church could be. It's the work of God through Jesus Christ and he is present in it and he is its life. If ever he's not present in it, if the church apostatizes from that apostolic doctrine and that truth as it is in Jesus, it's like as if the Lord Jesus Christ uh, shakes his head and says, I'm not with you boys anymore. I'm out of here. I will go and I will form myself a body that will represent me as I am. The Lord is with his church. Wherever that church is found faithful to his word and it's his work to make it so. So that's a marvellous thing. He, he abides with his church. And uh, I, I would also like to point out to you that attached to that promise of abiding is the glorious promise of the Holy Spirit. He abides with us. We looked at this a little bit a few weeks ago when we were talking about Christian comfort, how he will send the comforter and the advocate to be with us. So let me just touch on this very briefly. 
The Lord Jesus was about to go from the disciples bodily and leave them, and he promises before he goes that he won't leave them like orphans, remember? In John chapter 14, verse 16 and 17, he says, I will pray the Father. Now, this is going on in heaven when he gets there. At the right hand of God the Father, is a, here's a promise Jesus is going to take hold of and, and send to us. I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever even the spirit of truth. And then Jesus says in verse 18, through this spirit that he sends, I will come to you. So you're not going to be alone. I'll be back. I will be back. I'm coming to you through the Holy Spirit. And then in verse 20, through that indwelling spirit of Christ, the eternal Son of God now, he will not only be with them, but he'll be, this is just mind-blowingly marvellous. He will be in them. With you and in you. As I am in, with and in my Father, he says, I'll be with you and in you. <laughs> and he'll be working with them through the gospel. That's, that's what Jesus is talking about. That's what will equip them and us. We say to ourselves, well, are we equipped? Well, is the Holy Spirit with us? Is the indwelling Spirit given to us? Well, yes, he is. Are we equipped? Well, yes, we are. Not in our own strength, but in the equipage of the Lord Jesus Christ alone. So you find in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, after the Holy Ghost has come to you, he shall be witness, you shall be witness unto me both in Jerusalem and all Judea and in Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth, and I'll be with you to the end of the world. So that's a very marvellous presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now just let me mention before we move on quickly that that is a most emphatically spiritual presence that that is that is a presence of the lord jesus christ that is not simply notional it's not just simply an idea that the, that we as christians sort of latch hold of to give us ourselves some encouragement although it is a glorious truth that our minds must embrace but but that is a spiritual reality apprehended by faith and enjoyed by faith. So the Lord Jesus Christ, with all authority, through the indwelling of his Holy Spirit, is in and with us and in and with this part of his Christian church so that he is going now to work with us. He can't work with us unless he is with us. And so... So these things are marvellous encouragements. And so in closing, thirdly, he is working with them. And so in verse 20, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Uh, just very briefly, the Lord Jesus is not teaching us to think in, t in what we would call synergistic terms. That's a pretty useful word actually. That means that there's work going on and there's a combination of two contributing workers. So you've got God working and man working and when you get these things sort of all working together properly, man doing his part like he should, everything will work out and people will be saved. But that's, that's not at all what the Bible teaches. So when it says God working with us, it's not talking about a combination of divine grace and human work and merit mixed together that's going to save us or we save ourselves. Now don't switch off now. This is, this is important. The gospel teaches us not that we are working with God for our own salvation, but that God saves us by his grace. 
It's not synergistic, it's monergistic. It's God and his grace alone that saves us. It's Christ alone, grace alone, through faith alone. And it's always going to be to God's glory alone. So this is not talking about a combination of us and God working together. It's not talking about individual salvation at all, actually. What it is talking about is how the Lord Jesus Christ is pleased in the great plan and purpose that God has worked out and put in place. The Lord Jesus Christ is pleased to work in and through the gospel. And the gospel is placed into the hands of the Christian church in the world so that as the Christian church is faithful to fulfil its commission simply to preach the gospel and the truth of God into the world, then God, through Christ, does the work. <laughs> he works as the gospel is preached. So all the church can do, and it must do, and it's not a small thing, but all the church can do is preach the gospel. Keep it pure. Don't pollute it. Don't inject error into it. Preach the pure gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and the truth of the living God, and God will do the work. Jesus Christ, at the right hand of the Father, with the reins of providence in his hand, with his special providence and his irresistible grace, will do the work in people's hearts. I don't know about you, but I actually believe that. Do you believe that? That as the church preaches the gospel, not the modern gospel of self-fulfillment and self-help, uh, but the pure gospel of the living Saviour, Jesus Christ, that's preached into the world together with the law so that there's sin and guilt as a backdrop and a Saviour for us needy sinners is held forth so as the true gospel of God is preached, Jesus Christ will gather his people to himself. I believe that. I've got to tell you, when, I, when, when this congregation asked and called me to come to preach here at Winalier, I thought long and hard about it. And I thought to myself, if I go there, we're really going to be up against it. Because I know the history of the community. I know the struggles of the congregation. I lived here. I thought to myself, can I go there? Can I do that? And it came home to my heart, Chris, if you go there, all you've got to do and all you can do and what you must do is preach the gospel of a living, risen, exalted saviour and hold him forth before men and women and boys and girls as the answer to all their great needs, their real needs. And God will do the work. God will work with not this or that preacher, but God, through Jesus Christ and by the power of his Spirit, will work through the gospel. The gospel is the power of God under the salvation of all them that believe. I believe that. And brethren, that's the only reason that I'm preaching here today. Do you believe that? And will you even pray in light of that for the work of the gospel in this community and throughout the world because Jesus Christ has got his church in every little nook and cranny, every little windlier in every continent. And he's saying to the people there in exactly the same way, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel and, and believe this. I will be with you and I will work with you. 
Amen. Let's pray.